Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to It's Rainmaking Time. This is Kim Greenhouse. It gives me great pleasure to be inviting Richard Allen Miller here today, the author of ESP Induction, Through Forms of Self-Hypnosis. Richard Allen Miller is an author, a physicist, a biophysicist, and an herbalist. This book is one of a three-book series on the evolution of consciousness. Mr. Miller has had 11 years in Navy intelligence and was a lead physicist at the Pentagon for six of those years. He has done massive amounts of work in the area of anesthesia at the University of Washington. He's managed many intelligence projects that have to do with anesthesia and intuition. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Richard Allen Miller to its rainmaking time. Good day, sir. Good morning. Thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. Well, I've had enjoyable talking with you. Same here with you. ESP induction, what does that mean? Well, basically, uh, extrasensory perception, I, I think we're going to find it's not exactly what we think it is. It's not like seeing into the future uh, as much as we're more or less creating our own future. Um, basically, uh, a one word that could be used would be intuitions. And how does one tap further into those uh, already known uh, you know, informations. Basically, uh, when we started with Seal Corporation, which was eventually later called Seal Corp or then uh, Navy Seals, uh, the primary uh, uh, role was for me to develop a tool by which to separate uh, the top two percent of of uh, Navy, let's say. Uh, uh, graduates at, at Annapolis, which 2% do we train further? And it, rather than how many bridges you could blow up, how, many, uh, how, how much martial arts you known, the primary focus was on intuition and the ability to guess. When they came to a fork in the road, <clears throat> they wanted a 10-second protocol uh, to determine going right or left. And uh, they wanted a three-sigma error coefficient on that. What does that mean? Well, a sigma is your standard deviation, and a three sigma means that you are 99.9975% correct in your decision making. And we discovered in a laboratory that there was an altered state of consciousness just very close to our conscious awake state, but just slightly over to the left there, that your ability in guessing would increase more than 400 times where you are in a conscious state. And what they wanted was something that was very quick and very simple to teach. And then we looked for those that were right out of the gate already tapped into that and then tried to improve their ability in guessing. And those were the people that Navy decided then to go further and train them further. But the first criteria was intuitions, their ability in making a proper guess. Is that what intuition is? Well, it's difficult to know what it is, you know. Um, Isn't it a sensing? There are, well, there's different ways you can define that. Um, for example, you have a gut feeling. Sometimes we've always referred to the gut, like my gut says I should do this. That's because, in fact, we have now discovered that there are nerve, nerve uh, actual brain cells in your gut that function very similar to those in your brain. And there is, you, you have a different kind of feel. Now, the big key is how do you tap into that with consciousness so that you can actually use those intuitions as a tool? That was the challenge. We, we wanted to know how to take that information and somehow filter it so that we had a conscious awareness of it and were then able to act on it, that kind of thing. Does breathing come into any of this in terms of tapping into the gut brain, something called the gut brain? Well, yes and no. Yes, breathing is the first and last thing anybody does when they come into force space. Um, you know, the first thing you do when you come out of the womb is they whack you and you take your first gasp of air. And usually that's the last thing that you do when you exit this area. And so breathing has always been considered so important that it was actually in our universe part of our entire uh, 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 training.
training process where 10% of our life, whether you were jogging or riding a bicycle or uh, uh, doing Tai Chi, it was part of training the body and the mind, working to, you know, working uh, as, a, as a unit. And so breathing is extremely important in that regard. What is induction? The title of your book is ESP Induction. You induce it. You bring it forth. Uh, that's what induction means, to bring forth. Um, we found that, that we already know what we should be doing, which way to go. How do we bring it into consciousness so that there's no question, where there's no doubt? That part would be called induction, bringing it forth into a conscious level of awareness so that you are aware that this is the way I want to go, not that way. Later, I think we're going to find that it isn't that you're taking a peek into the future, you know, with clairvoyance or whatever, that in fact what you're doing is taking a look at the possibilities and making a decision on which way you can pull it off. And, and that will be ultimately toward the last book in the, in the series called The Non-Local Mind in a Holographic Universe. If you choose to see the universe as a holographic system rather than a quantized universe, what happens next is that information takes on a different dimension of resolution. And that's what we're really uh, actually doing when we talk about things like a physical thing or it's an emotional thing or it's an intellectual thing they're actually all the same they're just more higher vibration is that the right word that the higher form of the same phenomena in other words information is everywhere and how do you tap into that and how you tap into it with the resolution of it is to whether it has emotional intellectual or physical content to it can you describe to us what is a hologram in your translation as a physicist. Yeah, hologram. Yeah. When, why is it okay, so well, prevalent okay, today I, uh, and important? I have a story on how I discovered it. In 1969, I was uh, already out of graduate school. Oh, hey, no, it wasn't. It was 1967, excuse me. I was still in graduate school. I was at the University of Delaware, and they invited me over to the experimental research station, DuPont, uh, in Wilmington. And I was walking by, going to my labs there, and I was walking down a hall, and I looked in, and I saw a three-dimensional color TV. And this is 1967 now. that was actually operational. A big question in my mind is, why don't we have it in our universe today? Uh, but what they had done, there had been a mathematician named Gaber that had discovered that you could, what holographic meant was a compression of information. In other words, you could compress n dimensions of information into n minus one dimensions. Let's explore that. That would mean like a like a uh, DNA. The DNA is a three dimensional hologram of four space. That's because DNA contains who you were, who you are, and who you will be. What do you mean by four space? I need to pull you back a little well, bit. Time, adding time to the length, girth, and width of reality. Okay. And then, if you stopped and looked at the brain, which is kind of like a big crystal on the top of, a, of an antenna, your body, you could say that the brain is a four-dimensional hologram of five space. That means it's constantly changing with amorphous semiconductors and liquid crystal phases in the brain. It's At any given moment, it's in constant change, which means it's a four-dimensional hologram of five space. And what that implies is that you can change the movie. That means what you're experiencing, most of us on the earth right now, is what I would call horror on Elm Street. It's a terrible, it's a terrible reality, <laughs> but it's because of where we're 